Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Yost from the National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools, and it is my pleasure to welcome you today to our Spotlight Series webinar on sharing best practices. We um, are now going to go ahead and get started. And the first thing I would just like to let everyone know is that um, some housekeeping issues so that we will be using the Q&A to the right-hand side of your screen to post comments and questions during the webinar. So please remember to send questions to all, not privately to host. If you do happen to send them privately to host, we still will receive them, so. For anyone that may experience connection issues, we do recommend using a wired internet connection versus a wireless connection. And we have posted the 24-7 helpline to WebEx in the chat box on your right-hand side. After today, just to let you know, the PowerPoint presentation in both English and French and the audio recording in English only will be made available via our SlideShare and YouTube accounts. We will be posting those links directly into the Q&A. Sorry, okay, and so we um, are going to ask you a few questions before we get started today as we try and get a sense for ourselves and our presenter, Lisa, um, as to um, the people who are joining us here today. So our first question is, how many people are joining you with today's session? And I'm seeing that uh, most people, um, it's just them. We do have a group of two to three people that have joined us, which is really great. And we're finding that's happening more and more often as we um, are holding our webinar series. So thank you to everyone who is responding to that question. And um, some of you may or may not be familiar with our Spotlight on Methods and Tools webinar series. And this is our webinar series that we've been holding for the last couple of years, which highlights resources from our Registry of Methods and Tools available at NCCMT. And this is our 23rd episode in the Spotlight series. And again, we'll be featuring the Sharing Best Practices um, method and tool today. And a link has been posted to the NCCMT summary statement for the Sharing Best Practices um, tool. So another question trying to get a sense of where people are joining us from today, if you could tell us where you're from, um, within Canada, the province or territory, or outside of Canada. So thank you to all of those who are currently answering, and it seems that we have some people from BC, from Alberta, Ontario, Quebec, and um, let's see, do we have anyone joining us from? Outside, yep, we do have someone uh, someone joining us from outside of Canada, excuse me. So thank you, that's wonderful. And thank you to everyone who um, is responding um, to our polling questions today. So for those of you who may or may not be familiar with NCCNT or the National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools, we are one of um, the centers of the National Collaborating Centers for Public Health Program dispersed throughout the country with a total of six national collaborating centers, which are all funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada. We here at the National Collaborating Centers for Methods and Tools, or NCCMT, are located at McMaster Uni University in Hamilton. While four of the MCCs support the use of research evidence in specific public health content areas, such as infectious diseases or environmental health, ourselves and NCC Healthy Public Policy do work across content areas. And our focus here at NCCMT is to improve the access to and use of methods and tools that support moving research evidence into decisions related to public health practice, programs, and policy. And we do that um, by offering a range of products and services 
one of which we'll be talking about today, which is our registry of methods and tools, but we also have several other products and services available on our website at nccmt.ca that we welcome you to um, take a look at and see if they can also help you with evidence-informed decision-making and knowledge translation. So again, as we move along, just trying to understand a bit about what sector you're from. Um, within public health, in education, research, working within policy. And thank you again to all of those who are responding. It seems that um, we have lots of people working um, as public health practitioners, a few in research and education, some also working in provincial, territorial government and ministry, which is great. Um, so we have a really nice um, array of people joining us today with different backgrounds. This is really wonderful. Thank you again for joining us today. And um, it's my uh, pleasure to present Lisa Mwakumbo, who is a program officer at Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs and the Knowledge for Health K4 Health Project. So um, as you can see, Lisa is joining us from outside the United States, which is absolutely wonderful. So we're very happy to have our colleague um, from the States join us today. And at this time, um, it is my pleasure to turn over the presentation to Lisa as um, she is going to share with us um, her knowledge and some application of the sharing best practices approach. Again, we will have some time at the end of the session today for questions for Lisa. So please do post your questions in the Q&A and I will be asking them of Lisa for you towards the end of our um, webinar today. So Lisa, my pleasure, over to you. Thank you, Jenny, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, just one check, is my screen large enough or would you like me to increase it more? Can everyone see okay? Yeah, I think we're doing okay, Lisa. I'll let you know if anyone okay, has wonder. anything different. Um, if you do okay. have trouble seeing or anyone that's on the line today, please send us a message in the chat and Q&A and we'll bring it to Lisa's attention. Thanks for checking, Lisa. Thanks, wonderful. So um, just to give you a little bit of background, so um, as Jenny mentioned, I'm with Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs and the Knowledge for Health Project is a United States Agency for International Development project um, that is led in terms of implementation by CCP. And it's a five-year project. It's of their largest global KM um, project, knowledge management project for family planning that the US, that the US Agency for International Development funds. Um, it's been in existence in one shape or another for like the last 30, 35 years. And we're currently in our third year of um, a five-year award. So the tool that I'm going to be speaking about today is one that was developed under a previous iteration um, of this project back in 2005. And so largely this presentation is going to be looking at knowledge management approaches for capturing and sharing really lessons learned and how this tool specifically um, goes about that for internal best practices. Some of the focus since 2005, um, an emphasis has shifted somewhat, so there's still um, a number of initiatives looking at high impact practices or promising um, approaches or practices, but some people have moved away from the terminology best practices somewhat um, for two reasons. One is the definition and criteria can get kind of um, a rabbit hole of um, discussions around, and then second, um, at least for this tool in particular, some of the examples and benchmarking were really more for service delivery organizations. And so as more of a programmatic organization, we want to not only just look at what is working in terms of a best practice, but what isn't working. So some of the framing has shifted a little to kind of more generally lessons learned. So I'm, I'm gonna speak to you today about um, what our current kind of 
conceptual framework is for knowledge management and how best practices fit within that, and then specifically about the guide and some of the CAM approaches discussed in the guide that we have um, institutionalized in the work that we do. So the essential question is, to reach our goals as an organization or as a sector, um, does everyone have the knowledge they need to do their job properly and effectively? And if not, how can we fix this? And in our, um, it is our belief that knowledge management can help people fix this situation. So here's our first polling question that I'll let Jenny introduce. Great, thanks Lisa. And so we will uh, be keeping everyone on their toes with some polling questions throughout the webinar as well. So um, what would be helpful for Lisa um, to get to understand a little bit about our audience today is what um, you think is knowledge management? So if you could um, let us know your response uh, a vague intellectual exercise that doesn't apply to everyone, the art of building websites and databases, a technology solution to an organizational problem, something that folks in your organization do, mainly those IT geeks or librarians, that isn't applicable to my work, or none of the above. So thank you to all of you who are responding, and um, Lisa and for the rest of the group, we are seeing that the majority of people joining us today have answered um, none of the above, and a few people have answered um, that uh, number three, a technology solution to an organizational problem. But the majority of people have um, actually answered none of the above. So Lisa, I think we're okay to move on. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, and that is um, at least our answer as well, that it's none of the above, and in fact, our definition is that CAM is a systematic process of collecting and curating knowledge and connecting people to it so that they can act effectively. So um, as you could see by this, um, we're not talking about just Technology actually doesn't even really make the list. If anything, we're really talking about the processes and the importance that people play in knowledge creation, knowledge capture, and basically innovating on that knowledge. So um, with this, oh, sorry. So with this definition, we've created um, kind of a conceptual model looking at the systematic process. And the analysis and strategic design phases, you can kind of consider part of the learning before you do an implementation of an intervention. Then there's the actual implementation and monitoring, which is really looking at the knowledge management cycle and knowledge assessment, knowledge generation, knowledge capture, knowledge synthesis, knowledge sharing, and we have a number of different products and services and approaches to doing these type of things and also building capacity around the actual implementation of knowledge management interventions. And as you can see in the monitoring box, best practices is identified along with lessons learned as part of like our iterative and ongoing monitoring. And then there's evaluation, of course. So our ultimate goal is that knowledge is used to ideally improve either health behaviors, health outcomes, or some level of service delivery. So when we talk about knowledge management and specifically even best practice initiatives, initiative. we're really talking, sorry, there's a little feedback. We're talking about um, knowledge in the sense of two types. So there's often the explicit knowledge, which is what you see in the iceberg, like the 20%, um, which is what's already documented, what people have access to, what's tangible, visible, and easily shareable. And then you have the tacit knowledge, which is the bulk of knowledge that exists that's largely in people's heads. So that's kind of your, what your lessons learned are based on your experience. Not all the time and often that is not always documented just due to often time and space limitations of all of us being very busy professionals. 
So you might be wondering why knowledge management and what does this have to do with best practices? So basically knowledge management approaches help to translate tasks and knowledge into explicit knowledge. This is extremely true in the case with best practice initiatives. It addresses information overload or the problem of insufficient information. It reduces time spent looking for quality resources, helps organizations, or I'm sorry, organize information so it is easier to find, supports knowledge adaptation and translation, helps take research to practice, improves decision making, reduces program costs, prevents reinventing the wheel. Largely, these benefits of KM mayor what is described in the tool for sharing best practices as the benefits of a best practice initiative as well. And as I mentioned earlier, the ultimate goal is that knowledge does save lives. And we connect program managers and health workers to the latest evidence-based health knowledge that helps them to act effectively. Um, as I mentioned, the k for health project, we're largely a global project, um, and more recently we've been working um, in Western regional entities in West and East Africa mostly, and then at the country level to strengthen capacity of others to get knowledge into the hands of program managers and health workers who need it the most. So the common elements of KM and best practice initiatives are what many of you probably already know, people processes and tools slash platforms or technologies. And so from a KM perspective, the people are those who create and share knowledge. Collectively, they com comprise the culture that nurtures and encourages knowledge exchange. The processes are the methods used to acquire create, organize, share, and transfer knowledge. So what I mentioned earlier in our conceptual model related to the knowledge management cycle um, or the implementation stage. And then technology refers to the mechanisms that facilitate knowledge exchange, um, the, the storing and providing access to data information and knowledge created, um, and is largely kind of used as, um, it's leveraged basically to make sure that the processes are working so that they meet the needs of the people. So in a lot of ways, you can see it as um, a hierarchy in terms of importance where people play the kind of key role in knowledge management um, activities and initiatives. Um, and technology can be used to facilitate a lot of the processes. Likewise, in order to carry out a best practice initiative, you need people to facilitate identification and sharing of internal best practices. Um, you need processes and tools that are designed to share knowledge through reports, electronic discussions, and face-to-face -face meetings, as well as commitment to take the time needed to identify, document, and share best practices. This element of commitment largely speaks to the overall organizational CAM culture or enabling environment. So I have another um, poll question for you all. Um, based on kind of what I've just gone over, I was interested to know um, which kind of CAM processes are often used as part of best practice initiatives. Great, thanks Lisa, and um, it's Jenny here, and um, we can see that there's actually a range of answers here. So um, actually we have probably a really good even split across all of the answers um, below. I would say it looks like the majority of people are answering um, number one, number four or five. But um, it is pretty Great. evenly split across all of the different um, responses there for you, Lisa. Wonderful. And this question is really um, a multiple response. And there's not necessarily a definitive right and wrong. Um, but from how the guide lays things out is there's basically kind of two, two elements to a best practice initiative. And um, 
actually, I'm going to go through those a little bit in the next slide as well. So this is a little repetitive, but basically it involves the knowledge capture and synthesis, often in the form of publications and resources and knowledge sharing. So through electronic discussions, face-to-face -face meetings, but those are kind of the two or three elements that the book um, or the guide itself really lays out because it's basically showing how with the production of some kind of written record, newsletter, book, report, database, you're capturing explicit, you're providing explicit knowledge and then sharing of that is done typically in a way so that there's the tacit knowledge experiential that's also taking place at the same time. Um, and the reason why this is important is one, it shows the link with knowledge management in particular, but it also shows that a best practice, um, once defined, there's always the opportunity to um, adapt and evolve depending on the circumstances and situations of implementation in the next kind of setting. So um, I would say that TASA knowledge is still very much at play. Um, and that we can discuss that more later. So um, before kind of going into some of the CAM approaches that are outlined in the guide as well as um, regularly used by k for health I was wondering if you can give me a sense of how many of these approaches um, you're already familiar with and have used yourselves for capturing and sharing best practices. Great, so um, seeing everyone's responses, the majority of people um, are responding on um, communities of practice. That would be the, the most um, frequent response. And then actually many people, a few other people are answering um, all of the different other types of approaches. But definitely communities of practice is the um, most common type that our participants today have um, used to capture and share best practices, Lisa. Great, thank you very much. And so, and this slide really highlights um, some of the approaches from this idea of sharing TASA knowledge or asking. So these systems, processes, and behaviors support people seeking knowledge from other people. So asking may be one of the most effective ways to transfer knowledge. For example, many doctors will say they ask a colleague if they're looking for information versus looking up the information in a textbook. It is often quick, effective, and allows for a back and forth exchange. So um, some approaches for doing this, as you've all mentioned and are familiar with, are communities of practice, um, we also often use after action reviews, um, peer assist, twinning, study um, tours, and many others. And then there's the publish angle in which um, you're really looking at systems and processes and behaviors that support people contributing their knowledge in some kind of form, whether that's a database, a policy brief, guidelines, journal articles, manuals, project reports. Um, as well as blogging and a number of other mediums. So basically, those type of approaches can be used throughout the steps that um, are outlined in the guide. And those key steps in identifying and sharing best practices include looking for successes, identify and validate the best practices, document best practices, create a strategic plan for sharing, and adapt and apply. So looking for successes. Um, as I mentioned earlier about commitment being an important element um, or component for a best practice initiative is really the culture and space to intentionally learn from each other and listening to staff, um, no preconceived judgments. And also I think that means also being open to the fact of sharing 
quote unquote failures. You learn just as much if not more from something that goes wrong as something that goes well or goes right. Um, and identifying performance problems or challenges or those contextual issues that um, contributed to the success or to the failure as it may be. Um, at k for health we regularly employ peer assist um, which is done often before getting started in um, a new intervention area with other colleagues that have maybe done a similar activity but in a different country context or for a different funding stream or maybe around a different technical topic but are employing kind of the same type of intervention. We often do after action reviews. So after any kind of deliverable has been accomplished, whether that doing a literature review, developing a gender strategy for the project, um, whether that kind of completing a phase of a certain uh, intervention approach. We often invite the people that have been involved to come together and kind of share what worked, what didn't, and kind of um, where do we go from here. We do needs assessment. Um, as well as a number of other techniques. Um, we also invite other, others from the organization as a whole. So CCP, there's the CAM unit in which is where I sit, and then there's strategic behavior change um, unit, as well as our research and capacity building units, which relate directly to our two technical areas of CAM and um, and SBCC. And so we might invite um, a colleague from the other unit to make a brown bag presentation or invite other organizations to present kind of their experience implementing similar interventions but in different contexts so we can continue the learning either prior to like getting started or in the midst of it all and trying to like brainstorm how to deal with some um, unanticipated kind of challenges. So one of the um, techniques that I mentioned was the after action review, and we find that hugely useful and as part of just our processes. And I guess I was just wondering how many of you are familiar with and ever participated in an after action review. So thank you to everyone who is answering. So um, it seems to be, um, there's a few people who have, um, participated in an after action review. Um, similarly, the same um, about half or so that have and a few people that are actually not sure if they've actually participated in an after action review. So thank you to everyone who has been responding. Thank you. Well, and so I just wanted to give you a little bit of background and also at the end of my presentation, um, I will provide some links and um, We've developed a CAM for global health e-learning course that has some really useful resources as they relate to an after action review. But basically it's a simple process used to capture the lessons learned from past successes and as well as failures with the goal of improving for future performance. Um, it's really an opportunity for the team to reflect. We try to do it soon after an actual um, milestone or deliverable has submit, been submitted so that one, it's a fresh experience in folks' minds, but two, so that those lessons learned can really be captured and articulated to, to be informative of kind of next steps. Um, so, and I, well, I guess I could share with you a specific example. Um, so I was the project director for a four-year project um, that aimed to strengthen the knowledge and skills of medical laboratory scientists in Nigeria through the institutionalization of a continuing professional development policy. In order to achieve this goal, we helped to update the government CPD policy and put systems and processes in place for actually implementing and monitoring it. In addition, we worked with a local professional association to develop accredited e-learning courses. So every year for that four-year period, we conducted course author trainings that were about three-day face-to-face um, step-down trainings with the new set of course authors for that year. 
after the initial training and actually sub after every subsequent training, we provided mentoring and support until the courses were actually launched. After um, the launch of the courses, we always conducted an after action review to see what worked well, what didn't, and to adjust not only our training, but the process for selecting course authors as a result to make sure that um, we were, our training and also what we were, be, what they were being asked to do as course authors was clearly articulated, so expectations were better aligned. Um, we also have used this technique after we conducted our first facilitated um, learning cohort, or what we refer to as a study group, um, where we worked with the course author to kind of debrief on what she felt worked well using this new medium and this kind of um, pace of engaging learners, um, but online. And we made sure to document that so that as we move forward in conducting similar study groups, but with other course authors, we kind of learn to better set our expectations and to better set like the schedule and calendar to make sure that things move as smoothly as possible. So step two, um, so as I said, like most of my examples aren't necessarily best practices in the sense of um, service delivery, it's more in the sense of applying, like, learn, lessons learned and applying those lessons learned for future programmatic improvements. Um, now, in terms of identifying and validating practices, best practices, there's the observing people site projects that are producing excellent results. You can conduct focus group discussions or interviews with top performers. There's identifying contextual factors, reviewing existing evidence and service um, statistics. In this case, you know, there's a lot of really great work um, and documentation that's been done around this related to um, high impact practices for family planning. Um, there's actually a website, um, fphighimpactpractices.org, that has synthesized the evidence and recommendations on how to implement selected um, evidence-based family planning interventions across a wide variety of um, areas in the sense of whether they're service delivery interventions or more behavior change oriented um, or, or um, related to the enabling environment. Now, and from our experience, we've also kind of looked at some specific intervention areas related to e-learning again. We manage the Global Health e-learning center, and we've noticed that some of our courses seem to easily progress through the technical review process where they are um, reviewed and vetted by other experts that haven't been part of the course authoring experience. Um, and some go real smoothly and take the total of what we suggest will, a course will take six to nine months to produce and get through the entire course development process. And then there are other courses that are kind of our problem children and seem to get really held up at the point of technical review. And so as a team of course managers, we met and looked at like some of our specific STAR courses versus our problem children and try to look at what the commonalities are and where we might be able to provide better guidance to course authors before getting to the stage of technical review, as well as um, providing better instructions to the technical reviewers and giving feedback so that that was more streamlined and focused. So step three and four, the document and share best practices. Um, as I mentioned already, there's the high impact practices for family planning, um, which have been, it's a project that 
USAID has funded and I believe working with WHO as well as a number of implementing partners to identify what those practices are based on the evidence, the published evidence to date. Um, the writing up of a description is often helpful to have some kind of template that guides those descriptions. In our case, we do have like a standard case study template and I'm happy to share a link to that as well if you're interested or the Word doc. Um, and then creating like a central repository. So determining who you wanna share it with is really important and gets to really the next step to a certain extent, but um, not only internally among staff and making sure that they're familiar, but also in terms of elevating that evidence to be shared more broadly. So there are groups such as um, the Implementing Best Practices for Reproductive Health Consortium, I believe it's a consortium, and they serve Basically, they meet twice a year in person, um, typically in the Washington, D.C. area. It kind of depends on where they're, the organization that's chairing them, um, where they are located. And then they have a very vibrant community of practice um, that they, I believe, funded, WHO supported um, World Health Organization, the development of the Knowledge Gateway, and it serves as, as a backbone kind of community of practice, not only for that consortium, but more broadly as an internal tool for WHO, as well as a number of other um, online community of practices that you might be familiar with in terms of DG groups and others within the development sector. So for us, as I mentioned, we, um, the sharing of it, one, will depend on who you've identified as the audience for the best practice um, and whether or not, you know, what type of, that would also influence what type of medium or the documentation purposes is the most relevant, um, whether that's that kind of case study template or a blog or a video or a guide um, in exactly where you're sharing it or where you're putting it. Um, over the past five to six years, We've started a number of projects in country. So previously, the CAM unit um, has largely been more of a global project, and more recently, we've been doing a lot more field level activities. Um, we're not always great at sharing um, some of those more tacit knowledge experiences. Um, and so we've come together as a team for anyone who's involved in any of the country level work, um, we come together for, I believe it's a quarterly meeting, and then we're also on a listserv together that's um, associated with a project management tool called Basecamp. And an example in which this has been really useful is the fact that um, in the Nigeria project, um, I had to create a sustainability plan within six months of starting the project and then revisit it and revise it again at the two-year mark. And a colleague of mine who is leading the Indonesia project that has nothing to do with medical laboratory scientists or continued professional development, it's really focused on um, using KM approaches to um, help, uh, to help advocacy efforts in um, increasing the uptake of long-acting um, reversible contraceptive methods. So very, very different context as well as aims, but she was also asked to provide um, a sustainability plan at the end, the last during the last year of the project, which is right now. And so she was able to send an email out to the listserv and basically say, okay, this is my need. Are there any templates or are there any you know, information that people can help provide. And um, I was able to share what we had and it ultimately served as kind of at least the outline of what the main components should be for her um, document as well. And so that really gets to step five, which is the adapt and apply. So bringing people together in different networks, comparing settings, um, 
and then focusing on that transfer of the main idea behind the practice. Um, maybe not always the exactly how the implementation went, but it's also nice though to often know what worked well in terms of implementation and what didn't and why. So what some of those maybe cultural or circumstantial um, factors were to like just have that in the back of one's mind as they try to apply a practice. Um, and then monitoring that, uh, the application and the actual uptake. So um, that really is the steps within the guide and how we've applied them in our work. Um, I hope that this has been helpful. I have um, a video that I would like to share that I'm having a hard time hovering over. Um, Jenny, can I have some help from your team? I don't know if they have the hover over capability. I'm not seeing it. Sure, Lisa, no worries. I am, if everyone just bears with us for a brief moment for technical difficulties, I am just going to um, allow our um, teammates at Health Evidence to um, see if they um, are able to help with the um, recap video. So just give us a moment, everyone, and really sorry for that. Oh, there we go. In 2008, a school of one day of renowned surgeon public health highlighted a powerful innovation to improve surgical care in eight hospitals around the world. Only three months after implementation, the effect of this innovation was to help outcomes in all eight hospitals for the science. The results show that the use of the cutting edge tools cut the infection rate in half. It reduced the rate of major complications by 36% and the death rate fell by 47%. What was this groundbreaking innovation? A check. Every day brings new developments in research, technology, and tools. Oh, sorry, everyone. It looks like we are experiencing some diff Oh, and that's perhaps I caused that error, so I apologize. We'll turn it back um, to that. And we are experiencing a bit of feedback, so we do apologize. Um, perhaps we can, on our own, try and fix the volume of it. Why did this simple checklist map the infection chain? It offered staff the exact knowledge they needed the moment they needed it. In other words, it gave them the capacity to act effectively in high pressure, fast paced environments. This is a powerful example of what knowledge management can achieve. There are two types of knowledge. Imagine an iceberg. Explicit knowledge is tangible, visible, and easily expressed. It can be shared through presentations or written documents. However, explicit knowledge is just the tip of the iceberg. Most knowledge is technical, intangible, invisible, and based on first person experience. Think about riding a bike. If so, you didn't learn to ride a bike by reading the instructions. Instead, you likely watched a friend ride a bike, got to see their parents, finally tried it yourself. Now, riding a bike is second nature. But it's hard to articulate this knowledge. Hacking knowledge is a part of the work that is preferred to the team. It is the skills, insights, and intuition, and it is often shared through discussions, stories, and observations. Knowledge gives us the ability to translate evidence into action. There are three primary components of knowledge management people, process, and platform. One approach is online communities of practice or the use of information and communication technologies to connect people with common goals and interests. In communities of practice, people engage in knowledge management by exchanging ideas, telling their stories, and sharing best practices. To facilitate this exchange, they use processes such as webinars to ensure essential knowledge is systematically captured and shared in a timely manner. Electronic information repository is an online toolkit. Evidence databases and photo sharing websites are all examples of knowledge management platforms. Other platforms include 
Microsoft Chrome application, internet, and data visualization software. Besides community and practice, other knowledge management approaches include after action review, storytelling, and share fair, or events where participants learn from each other's presentations, successes, and challenges. By facilitating the exchange of life cycle evidence, expertise, and experience among health professionals, knowledge management plays an essential role in strengthening health systems and improving health outcomes in the world. We all do knowledge management every day, often without noticing it. Sharing a report with a colleague, posting a question on an online forum, or even meeting with another organization to give advice, this is knowledge management. Why should you use knowledge management in your health program? The answer is simple. It can lead to a more capable workforce, which in turn strengthens health systems, enhances quality of care, and ultimately improves health outcomes. Knowledge management can be as simple as a checklist at the end of a survey whose patient walks out of the hospital cleaner and healthier. Knowledge is essential to improve public health. Knowledge management ensures that it is translated into action, not only improving health outcomes, but saving lives. Great. Thank you all. I hope that um, was useful and a nice summary of kind of the main messages related to knowledge management, as well as as they relate to the importance of, of best practices. I hope you were able to hear me. Sorry, I might have spoke too soon. But um, I, I was just saying that I, I hope that you enjoyed that video and it was a nice summary as to the important role that knowledge management plays in public health, as well as then ultimately the important role that best practices initiatives do as well. Um, and I wanted to just close the presentation with um, sharing some additional CAM resources and tools with the group. So the video in which I just showed is also available on this k4health.org backslash topic backslash knowledge management, um, a great community of practice for global health practitioners is called the Global Health Knowledge Collaborative, um, and they have a really great website if you're interested. And then there's the KM um, e-toolkit that includes a number of case studies and um, basically uses our more or less our template for those case studies. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we have a CAM in Global Health Programs e-learning course that's also available freely if you want to learn more about after action reviews or some of the other techniques that were mentioned. So thank you all for your time. I'm looking forward to um, the Q&A and um, I'll pass it over so um, we can get that started. Great, thank you so much, Lisa. And just to let everyone know in the chat section, we have posted the link to all of the um, resources that Lisa has added um, to this last slide. And we do apologize for the quality of the audio um, on the video. Um, we were trying our best to improve it. So if you were not able to catch it in whole, um, please do uh, visit the Knowledge for Health website um, to view the video again. So again, we do apologize, thank you. And so we would like to um, invite everyone um, to post questions to the Q&A and um, send your questions um, to me uh, as, um, or to all as so we can all see your questions and then I can ask them of Lisa. So we'll give everyone a few moments to post any questions that they have. In the meantime, Lisa, I do have a question for you Why we're waiting yes. to see if um, people have questions in the QA. So your after actions reviews process, just wondering if you could um, speak a little bit more about this. Um, for example, like how long does it usually take? Um, you know, how far in advance do you plan for something like this? What actually, you know, the materials that are brought, just maybe some real, um, sort of nitty-gritty um, aspects to these after-action reviews so that people could implement them possibly in their local environment? Sure. So um, we've actually developed kind of a cheat sheet, like a template to help kind of 
facilitators of the after action review. Um, it kind of tells them what it is, why should you do it, um, who should be involved, and like when is an after action review um, a good idea to have. So we talk about doing it after an event. So for example, a training workshop, coronation meeting, or share fair. Um, upon the completion of an activity, like a baseline survey or systematic literature review, um, and also that they're useful as follow-up follow -up activities. Um, so typically what happens is we don't, the planning for it usually means it, we try to have it take place within a week to 10 days after the event or the completion of an activity. Sometimes that might be a little bit more delayed um, because we want those who've been involved or most closely involved to all participate. So if someone's traveling and unable to make it, but they played a really critical role, we might postpone it beyond that week or 10 day time frame. Um, but you can do an after action review virtually on the phone or in person as long as the facilitator ensures that everyone has the opportunity to share their feedback and to listen. Um, it truly is a very, um, it's a very informal, so we, I mean, we provide some uh, questions for a facilitator to use, and it's about an eight question long template, um, but it's a very simple process that usually can be completed in an hour or less. Um, and the more complex a, um, after action reviews might relate to like the complexity of the actual intervention or event or whatnot that you're reviewing together. Um, and in that case, it might take several hours to complete. Um, and in that case, too, you might want not only the team that's been involved, like the core team, but also maybe you'd want to invite some external partners and donors. It really depends on um, the, just, how, just how complex the actual activity is that you're discussing together. Um, because the group size is most likely going to be larger. That's why it would take more time because it's really important that everyone's voice is heard in the process. Did that help? And usually like based on the template, so we, we ask eight basic questions. So what, what did we set out to do? What were the anticipated results? So that's question one. Question two, what did we actually do? What were the actual results? Three, if there were differences, what caused them? Four, what worked? Why? Five, what didn't? Why not? In other words, what could we have done differently? Number six, what will the team sustain or enhance? Seven, what would you do differently next time? Eight, what are some future opportunities to apply what we've learned? So depending on the actual activity we're reviewing, some of those questions might be more relevant than others, but for the most part, they've um, held up for what we are often looking at. Great, Do you Thanks, have any additional Lisa. questions? Well, I don't, but it seems like our audience okay. does. So um, it's great, thank you for answering my question. Um, and now more importantly, some of our participants' questions. So um, Preeti would like to know, when you ask people to share successes? Does it discourage people from sharing efforts that have failed? How do you make it safe for people to share failures? So that's actually one of the big reasons why we often um, don't talk about best practices per se and we frame things more around what are the lessons learned. And we always make sure to share that um, the fact is you often learn more from what didn't go well, and that that's often the case um, regardless of the environment. And we also, we've used the technique, um, so there's, we do share fairs um, often, um, and as well as fair, fail fairs, where um, we look at people in our, like colleagues that, you know, we know like certain things have gone gone poorly, um, 
and we asked them if they'd be willing to share. Oftentimes, those fail fail fairs usually also have potentially like a, a happy hour component <laughs> that's set up for either after the like um, discussion or even like as part of, um, if we're doing it more informally as part of like our internal organization. We've also um, have done fail fairs with um, a number of other implementing partners who are willing to kind of share what didn't go well. Oftentimes those take place among other people that are um, also PAM advocates. So I think they recognize the importance um, of this as well. Uh, oftentimes it's among peers in the sense of implementing partners. And we also don't necessarily, in those environments, always, um, one, the, the donor community may or may not be so included in that, depending on people's comfort level, because sometimes failures also re relate to some of the, um, uh, some of the processes or, um, or systems in place that are part of the donor environment that, you know, they don't have the power to change either, but, you know, for accountability's sake, you must do. Um, and also, we might not always, we advertise that we're having a sales fair, but we might not always do a lot of documentation related to it. It kind of depends on those who agreed to the presenters, their comfort level. Great, thank you so much, Lisa. And I'm not seeing any more questions at the moment, but um, we will just, we do have a few more slides. So if anyone um, does have any more questions, please um, post them in the Q&A, and I will ask them of Lisa for you. So um, just to let you know, your feedback is obviously important to us. So we would ask um, that you take a few minutes and participate in a short survey about today's webinar. It will help us to improve our webinar series as we move forward. And we do have um, one last polling question for you. So just wondering what your next steps are on um, accessing the tool itself reading the summary of the best practices tool, consider using um, what Lisa shared with us today, or tell a colleague about um, what Lisa shared with us today. And you, of course, can answer more than one question. And um, just to let everyone know what we're seeing and the results, we're seeing actually a range of all of the different options, So um, and pretty fairly spread across. So thank you to those of you who have responded. Much appreciated. And um, we would like to announce um, our next webinar it is on the Program Evaluation Toolkit and will be May 11th, um, same time, same place. And um, the Ontario Center for Excellence in Child and Youth Mental Health has developed a tool for conducting program evaluation that we think will be helpful for those of you who are working within program evaluation or involved or receive reports of program evaluation. So, you can register um, at the WebEx site, the same place that you registered for this webinar. And so I'll give um, everyone another moment to see if um, they have any questions. Um, we can certainly take them. Uh, Lisa, while we wait to see if anyone has any final questions, just wondering um, if you have any thoughts or anything else that you would like to share with those that have joined us today. Um, for those who are working more in service delivery, um, a useful project and uh, project website that I'm familiar with is Assist, and they do a lot around community uh, quality improvement. And so if you're working specifically in that area, um, I would strongly recommend their um, tools and approaches, and I can send, I could put that in the link. Great, thank you so much, Lisa. Um, and you know, I'm not seeing anyone else post any 